morning and welcome to Woodland Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you can join us virtually for this service of worship. If you're a member of Woodland, uh, we miss you. We wish you were here in the sanctuary with us, and yet we're also grateful to the Lord for this means where we can gather together virtually on the Lord's Day. And if you're a guest with us, we're grateful that you're here, and we hope that you are encouraged and strengthened in the Lord as we look to Him together. There are a few announcements uh, which are in your bulletin. Of course, you'll note that in-person activities for Woodland Presbyterian Church have been suspended until further notice. We'll continue to communicate with you via email, and hopefully you received on Wednesday the pastoral letter from me. If you need anything, you have our contact information there printed in the bulletin, and I'd encourage you to reach out to the elders or to the deacons. We are praying regularly for you. We would also encourage you to join us tonight at 6 p.m. for the joint live stream service with the Hattiesburg PCA churches. I'll be preaching this evening, the Lord willing, from Revelation 7, and uh, Reverends Jim McCarthy, Brian Davis, and Davis Morgan will be assisting in worship as well. So we hope that you can join us this evening for that live stream provided by our friends at First Press. Woodland members, you should be receiving or have received a letter in a stamped envelope in the mail uh, with which you can give your tithes and offerings. I know many of you have inquired about that, and we hope that you'll take advantage so that we can continue to support our uh, ministries locally and internationally in this time of being apart. Those are our announcements. I'd ask those of you who are able, as your circumstances allow, to join me in standing for our call to worship, which this morning comes from 1 Timothy 1, 17. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us worship God together, singing hymn number 38, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. proclaiming that you alone are worthy of praise and honor and glory, that you are the immortal God, the invisible God, that you do not diminish, unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting nor wasting, you rule in might, O God, you need nothing, you depend upon no one, you lack nothing at all, for you are fullness of glory, fullness of perfection, fullness of blessing. We are grateful, O God, to come to you this morning 
calling upon you, the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because you have revealed yourself to us and because you have made us alive by your Holy Spirit to see and to hear and to believe that we might be your true worshipers who worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask, Father, that you would draw near to us in your grace, that you would come to us and bless us by your word, that you would come and convict us of sin, that you would come and lead us in all righteousness, and that you would come and refresh us in the knowledge of the glory of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who took our sins upon himself, and whom you raised from the dead, and exalted above every rule and authority, above every name that is named. We pray, Father, that you would feed us upon your word, and we pray that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, coming to you as you taught us in your word, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll confess our faith in the immortal God using Westminster Shorter Catechism questions 1, 4, and 6. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. You may be seated, and we'll join our voices singing a setting of the 23rd Psalm, a different one than we sang last week, The King of Love My Shepherd Is, hymn number 184. Thank you. 
please join me in opening your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from verses 21 through 28. You'll remember from last time that Omri had overthrown Zimri after Zimri's brief reign. And our passage this morning speaks of Omri's reign. You'll notice in verse 24, he set up, uh, bought Samaria and set up a fortress there. And we'll encounter, as we did in the book of Hosea, for example, Samaria as a center of activity in the northern kingdom. One thing that we see in these verses is that sin has multi-generational consequences. Sin has multi-generational consequences, which is all the more reason that we must kill sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll see in verse 26 that Omri walked in the way of Jeroboam. So Jeroboam has been long dead, but his influence of idolatry lingers. Then we'll see after Omri, his son Ahab reigns. And while Omri might have been bad, his son Ahab was all the worse. And so we see both before and after Omri, the multi-generational consequences of sin, and therefore the urgency for us to be killing them. We should also remember, however, before we read our passage, that God's grace can overcome even the most sinful of genealogies. We have examples of this throughout the scripture. One in particular is Hezekiah, whose father Ahaz was not uh, a, God, a godly king, and yet Hezekiah was a leader in godliness. So while we have a warning here, there is encouragement in scripture that grace can overcome genealogy. And are we thankful for that? Well, let's hear God's word, 1 Kings 16, verses 21 to 28. Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ganath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ganath. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel, and he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned in Terza. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he fortified the hill and called the name of the city that he built Samaria after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sins that he made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols." Now the rest of the acts of Omri that he did, and the might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Omri slept with his fathers, and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his place. And then if you'd turn forward with me to the New Testament, we'll read Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. In these verses, we see Jesus identified as the Messiah, the Messiah promised throughout the Old Testament. We see, especially in verse 10, Jesus quoting from the prophet Malachi, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Well, if you were to look back in Malachi chapter 3, you would see that the one that the messenger, the one whose way the messenger is preparing, is the Lord. The messenger, whom we know to be John the Baptist, prepares the way for God to come. And God does come in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also see in these verses that there are people who miss Christ's coming especially the Pharisees and the scribes. Though John and others proclaimed his coming, the Pharisees missed the message. They thought John had a demon. They accused Jesus of being a glutton 
and a drunkard. While the message was proclaimed, they missed the message. And this is an encouragement to us to hear, and not only to hear, but to hear with faith that we might believe and be saved by the Messiah promised in the Scriptures. Matthew chapter 11, I'll read verses 1 through 19. When Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered him, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like the children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Well, having heard from God's word, let's turn to him together. Our Father in heaven, as we think about the way the scribes and the Pharisees responded to John and to Jesus, we praise you because we know if not for your intervening grace, if not for the life-giving work of your Holy Spirit, we would be in line with them, hearing the message but not believing, receiving the invitation but not coming. And we bless you, O God, and we praise you for your grace to us in causing us to believe, opening our ears to hear, opening our eyes to see, opening our hearts to understand what you've proclaimed in your word. We praise you not only, Father, for bringing us to faith, but for sustaining us in the faith. We praise you, O Lord, that like a faithful shepherd, you have led us and tended us. You have protected us. You have guided us and provided for us. We praise you, O Lord, for your providence and your goodness, that no matter where we go, your goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. We praise you, Father, for the knowledge that you work all things together for good for those who love you. And we praise you, Father, that even now, even at this very moment, you rule and reign over all for the good of your sheep. We praise you, O Lord, for your unfailing character, for your unchanging goodness, and for the dependability of your promises in your word. We pray, Father, that you would open more ears to hear. And we pray, Father, that you would use us in the relationships and in the families where you've placed us, here in Hattiesburg and throughout the world, to proclaim the message. But we pray, Father, that you would do, as we proclaim that message, what we are incapable of doing, which is opening blocked ears, opening blind eyes, softening hard hearts. And Lord, as your word, your powerful word goes out, that your almighty Holy Spirit would meet that word and work life and faith in those who hear. We pray, Lord, for our neighbors 
We pray, Father, for our children, that they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And Lord, we pray for brothers and sisters throughout the world, people uh, whom we know and love and support, and others that we will not meet until glory, that you would bless them as they seek to proclaim the gospel of grace. We pray, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine at the seminary there, that you would sustain their work in this season and that you would raise up pastors and that you would be equipping men to go plant churches and to lead your flock. We pray, Father, for the seminary in Uganda and the student we support there, that you would uphold them and bless them and protect them from all evil and that the church would be strong there. Lord, we pray that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to live in these trying days as those who have confidence in your providence. We pray for the help of the Holy Spirit to speak and to act in a way that shows that we trust in an all-sufficient God, in an all-powerful God, in an almighty God, in a God who governs and sustains all his creatures and all their actions for his glory. We pray, Father, that there would be an aroma on us, a savor on us that shows that we are living for another world, that shows that you, O God, are dependable, that we are secure, that even as pestilence spreads, that we have in you a refuge and a fortress and a hope in whom we trust. We pray, Father in heaven, that you would help us in these days to redeem the time. We pray, Lord, that as you give many of us more time at home, that you would help us to spend it in a fruitful way. We pray, Lord, for those who are still able to work, that you would bless their work. We pray, Father, for those who are in hospitals and caring for the sick, that you would sustain them. We pray, Lord, for those of us who are at home more often than we might be, that you would help us to be faithful with that gift of more time together. We pray, Lord, for your provision. We pray for daily bread. We pray for good health. Lord, we ask that you would protect every member of the Woodland Presbyterian Church from the coronavirus, that we would neither catch it nor transmit it. And we pray, Lord, that you would cause the numbers in Hattiesburg and Mississippi and throughout the world to go down. We pray, Lord, for health care workers, that you would keep them from catching the disease. We pray, Father, for those who are lonely, who may be in good physical health, but are at home by themselves. We pray, Lord, that we would be mindful of them, that we would check on them regularly, and that they would know that they have a friend that sticks closer than a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that as John Payton said, they would know themselves to be alone, but not alone. And we ask, Father, that you would meet with them there when they're home by themselves and encourage them and lift their head and strengthen them. Lord, we remember to pray for ministries that we support who are facing new challenges. We pray for PCS as they work to deliver education in a different way, that you would bless them, that you would provide for them. Bless our brother Alan Smithers and our brother Scott Griffith and all who teach there that you would give them wisdom and patience and diligence, and that you would provide in such a way that they can finish the semester. We pray for the same thing with families in public school and in home school, that you would provide, Lord, for education through the end of the semester. We pray for our friends at United Christian Academy and Jack Kennedy, Lord. We pray that you would provide for their needs. And we pray for Lifeline Christian Services as that work goes on, as they witness, Lord, to mothers and seek to place children in Christian homes. Lord, would you have mercy on them, and would you protect them from all evil, and would you bless their work, and would it prosper? We pray, Father, for our leaders. We ask that you would have mercy on the United States of America and on our president. We pray, Lord, for repentance in our land, repentance for materialism, repentance, Lord, for low views of life, for small thoughts of God, for selfishness. And we pray that our leaders would lead in a way that reflects unchanging and eternal truths. And that they would protect those who do good, Lord, and that they would be enabled to promote the good. We pray that you would bless them and have mercy on them, Lord, our mayor here and our governor and everyone in between. We remember, Lord, to ask for forgiveness. In a season, Father, where we are unable to gather on the Lord's Day, would you forgive us for when we have neglected meeting together for when we've been able to come and have not 
for when we have not valued your worship. Lord, would you use the taking away of this treasure gift to convict us for when we have despised it? We pray, Father, for you to forgive us for when we have neglected others. And as we are now isolated, Lord, would you forgive us for when we have had opportunities to do good and left it undone? We pray, Lord, for your mercy and for your forgiveness and for you to help us, Lord, to repent of sin in these days, to examine ourselves and to turn from every evil way. We ask, Lord, for your protection from Satan and from all evil. Lord, protect us from gossip. There's a temptation to want to pass along the latest word, even if we don't know it to be true. Keep us, we pray, from that. We pray that you would keep us from the temptation to waste time. And we pray that you would keep us from the temptation of sinful worry. Lord, when we have fallen into thinking that the Lord is not on the throne, forgive us and help us to fix our eyes on you in heaven. And keep us, Lord, from a hand-wringing sinful worry. We pray that you would build us up in holiness and confidence and peace and in trust, especially now as we turn to your word. And we ask in Jesus' name. And if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 23, and we'll continue our study of this psalm. Psalm 23. We began last week by noting that this is one of the most familiar sections of God's Word. Uh, likely many of you at one point in your Christian life have memorized this psalm. But we also said that while it is familiar and in many ways simple, it is also profound. And I said last week that what is said of John's gospel also applies to Psalm 23, shallow enough for a child to paddle and deep enough for an elephant to swim. Uh, last week we noted that the shepherd described in Psalm 23, the Lord, is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who reveals himself in John 10, 11, to be the good shepherd, that Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is the Lord who has come to lay down his life for the sheep. And we also noted last week how Psalm 23 emphasizes the shepherd's work for the sheep. Much that professes to be Christianity emphasizes what the sheep do for the shepherd. But Psalm 23 sets us straight. Christianity is first about what God has done for us, not about what we do for Him. And you see that refrain over and over and over again in this psalm. These blessings belong to the sheep because the sheep belong to the shepherd. And we do well to remember that order. Well, we'll see here in verse 2 of the psalm this morning that Jesus gives rest to his sheep. Jesus gives rest to his sheep. We'll pray and then I'll read the psalm. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would send out your light and your truth, that they would lead us to your holy hill and to your dwelling, that you would bring us, Father, by faith to the holy place, that you would feed us by your word that you would build us up in the knowledge of your Son, and you would fill us with thankfulness and worship at the privilege of being your sheep. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 23, this is the Word of God. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So far, God's word. Well, this morning we'll focus in on verse 2, 
where David tells us the Lord gives rest to his sheep. Jesus gives rest to his sheep. We noted last week in our study of verse 1 that with the Lord as our shepherd, God's people will not lack anything that they need for all that God calls them to do as long as he calls them to do it. And verse 2, I think, is best understood as a specific example of the general principle that David describes in verse 1. David says in verse 1, the sheep never lack. And then he goes on to tell us in verse 2 that one of the things that the shepherd provides for the sheep is rest. God's sheep will have rest. He doesn't, they don't lack rest. So verse 2 gives us a specific example of the provision described in verse 1. Now I think when we read verse 2, at least for me, what perhaps first comes to mind is food and drink. Green grass to eat, cool water to drink. And that may be true. But I think the heart of what's going on here in verse 2 is rest. First, notice in the green pastures, the first half. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Notice their posture in the pastures. They're lying down. They're not up on their legs eating. They're lying down. And while I'm not a sheep expert, the pictures of sheep I've seen, when they're standing, they're eating, and when they're lying, they're either chewing the cud or resting. They're lying down. And notice where they're lying down. They're lying in the green pastures. The Hebrew here gives us the idea of new, fresh, green grass. Grass that grows just after the rain has fallen. We might call it ancient Near Eastern memory foam. The type of grass that when I get up in the morning and walk out of the yard makes me say, I need to call Max to mow the lawn. He doesn't lead them to rocks. He doesn't lead them to dirt. He doesn't lead them to sparse. My freshman football season at Manchester Memorial High School, the year before we got a turf field, we had a sparse grass field that rivaled concrete for softness. That's not the type of grass where Jesus leads the sheep. He leads them to a place of rest, a place where they can lie down in comfort and where they can rest. Green pastures. But we also see this theme of rest in the second half of verse 2 in the still waters. He leads them beside still waters. Now, the translators here are doing their best to make sense of a difficult Hebrew phrase. In the Hebrew, the phrase, the word rest, could either describe the sheep or the water. The way the English Standard Version reads, it describes the water. He leads me beside still waters, that is, waters that are at rest. Waters where I can go up and take a drink in safety without worry of being swept away. But you may also have a footnote there in your Bibles that says, besides waters of rest. That is, waters by which the sheep can rest. The rest describing what the sheep do. By the waters. And while both are certainly appropriate, the idea of rest runs through. The sheep are lying down in a thick bed of grass next to a gurgling stream, a place of safety, a place of comfort, a place of peace, a place where they can rest. This is the rest that you feel when you come home after being gone for a long time. I remember driving back from Montana to Raymond, Mississippi in one straight shot. It was about 32 hours, as I recall. And I was very happy to make my way uh, back to Lakeview Place in Raymond and to get into bed. And you know that feeling after a long drive. When you get in, you lock the door, you make sure the burners and the curling iron are off, you shut the lights, you get under the covers, and you rest. And some of you might even have a gurgling stream noise function on your phone uh, that you play along with it. It's a place of absolute safety and comfort. It's the same rest that Naomi describes in Ruth chapter 1 when she wishes a blessing upon her daughters-in-law saying, May you find rest in the house of your husbands. 
place of safety, a place of rest, the waters by which the sheep rest. Pastures for resting, waters for resting. And we notice here that the sheep enjoy this rest on account of the shepherd. Look at the way David phrases it. He makes me or causes me to lie down in green pastures. That is, the sheep don't find the pastures themselves. Rather, the shepherd finds the pasture, brings them to the the pasture, and protects them once they're there. He leads me, David says, beside still waters. He takes me as though by the hand and brings me to the place where I can rest. The shepherd takes the initiative. The shepherd takes the responsibility. And the shepherd is near while they're resting. The sheep enjoy this rest on the count of the shepherd. They don't find it for themselves. The shepherd finds it for them. Well, with that in mind, let's take some time then to consider what kind of rest the shepherd provides. What kind of rest the shepherd provides. And there are four things, uh, four types of rest that I'd like to point out by way of application. The first type of rest that the shepherd provides is rest for your body. Rest for your body. Christianity is practical. It's a whole person religion. And while it emphasizes the life of the soul, it also deals with our bodies. Christ's salvation, the salvation that he accomplishes for us is a whole person salvation. And the rest that he provides, the rest described here in verse 2, is whole person rest. When you have Jesus as your shepherd, he provides rest for your body. Well, how is that the case? Well, there are at least a few ways. One is through the Lord's day. The shepherd has given us, his people, one day in seven to rest. In the Old Testament, this was called the Sabbath, and it was on the seventh day of the week. God's people worked towards a day of rest. In the New Testament, in light of Christ's resurrection on the first day, it's Sunday, the first day of the week. And God's people live their lives out of the rest that Christ has accomplished for them through his death and resurrection. To be God's sheep is to have 52 vacation days a year. 52 required days off where we rest from our normal work. To be God's shepherd is to never be further than six days from a day off. This is one of the ways that he provides rest for your body. When you come to Jesus and you believe on him and take his easy yoke and his light burden, he says, I I have a day of rest for you. It's called the Lord's Day where you can set aside your sports and your housework and your homework, where you can linger over a meal with your family, where you can gather with God's people for worship, where you can spend more time than you might otherwise with your Bible. You might even be able to take a nap or visit Weeks down the road, might I add, uh, Christian friends in their homes. God has provided rest for your body. And I would ask, if you're tired all the time, one reason might be, now not necessarily, but maybe, you should ask how you're spending your Sundays. Because one of the things that God provides to his people is physical rest. Now we're thankful for people like doctors and firemen and uh, law enforcement. The coronavirus doesn't observe the Sabbath and the doctors are working faithfully for us. But for most of us, Sunday's a day to set aside the normal things so that we can rest for God's worship. Sunday's a green pasture day for body and soul. I think it's a mercy of God as we see how this virus has upended our schedules. Daily life is very different than it was only a month ago. A virus may change your schedule, but the resurrection of Christ still sets your calendar week by week by week. And that's one of the ways that the shepherd provides rest for your body. The Lord's Day. A second way the shepherd provides rest for your body is sleep. I mean, actually going to bed at night. The psalmist says in Psalm 127, verse 2, 
It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. God wants you to sleep. Now, there's a difference to be made here, of course, from those who have trouble sleeping because of a physical disorder or because they have children in the home. That's not, I think, what Psalm 127.2 is talking about. Rather, it's saying if you're robbed of sleep because of anxious worry, that's not good. You have a shepherd who will protect you overnight. You have a shepherd with whom you can entrust your cares. Even in tumult, we see this in Psalm 3. When David says, I lay down and slept, I awoke again for the Lord sustained me. Even when Absalom is coming on him, even when David says, though many gather around me and seek me, he can sleep. And our Lord Jesus is a wonderful example of this in Matthew 8, 26. And in the tumult of the storm, he's asleep on the boat, on the cushion. You can sleep soundly at night because the shepherd can shoulder your cares until the morning. And while there are perhaps children in the home who keep you up or sicknesses that keep you up, let's lay our worry at the shepherd's feet and sleep. So that's rest for your body. Rest for your body. The second type of rest I'll describe is rest for your mind. Rest for your mind. Because the call to Christ, the call to have Christ as your shepherd, is a call away from sinful anxiety. A call away from sinful anxiety. Rest for your mind. You remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, 22 to 34. Consider the lilies of the field. Consider the birds of the air. If God feeds the birds of the air, if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more feed you? Will he not much more clothe you? He knows your needs, Jesus says. Or we could think of Paul's words to the Philippians in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious in nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, commit your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Or we could think of Peter's words in 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast your cares upon the Lord, for He cares for you. The call to Christ as your shepherd is a call to be done with sinful anxiety, to trust your worries to the shepherd. He provides rest for your mind. Because you know the shepherd who is at the helm of history, who is at the helm of providence, will only work all things for your good. Providence can only result in your good. Ultimately. And that should give rest to your mind. There are many cares and many real and frightening burdens in this life. But Jesus says, let not those burdens overrun you into sinful anxiety. Rest for your mind. The third type of rest that Jesus gives us as his sheep is rest for your soul. And we see this described most clearly in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, the unbeliever, the person who is outside of Christ, should be restless. Because they have all sorts of problems that they can't deal with, debts that they can't pay, sins that they can't cover. But Jesus says, if you're in me, if I'm your shepherd, you can have rest in your soul. Rest in your soul. Think about why. Your soul could be undone because you're working off to pay the debts that you know you have to God. Debts of sin. And you're trying, you're working, you're struggling to pay off the debts that your sins have brought. 
But trying to pay off your own debts before God by your deeds is like trying to pay off the national debt with a lemonade stand. The interest is going higher than the profit. But when you come to Jesus, he says, there's rest for your soul, you who are working to pay off your debts of sin, because Jesus, the shepherd, paid your debts at the cross. He took the chastisement your sins deserve at Calvary. He paid the debt by his blood. And so he says, if your soul is working to pay for your debt of sin, rest. Come to me and rest. Because I paid it all. Or perhaps you're working in your soul to do enough good. You think that if you do enough good things, you'll be better than enough people to be received by God. I think of a Dutch Reformed minister friend who went to my father-in-law's farm in Holmes County. Uh, This is an interesting picture already. And he went to speak to one of the men on the farm. uh, And he said, Charles, are you serving the Lord? He's a very joyful evangelistic brother, Dutch Reformed brother. And Charles said, well, I'm trying to be good. And my friend, the minister, said, Charles, that's not good enough, Charles. Trying to work your way to do enough good to God is like trying to climb your way out of a hundred foot hole with a two foot ladder. It just isn't going to work. But the good news is that Jesus the shepherd was obedient to the point of death. Even Paul says in Philippians 2.8, death on a cross, all the way up to the cross. And Jesus the shepherd takes his perfect righteousness, his obedience, and puts it in the account of the sheep. So he says, you're working to do enough good. You can't, but be at rest. Come to me and believe. My perfect righteousness is yours. And the third type of rest for the soul that Jesus provides is the rest that we need for the covering of our sins. Our sin is like a glass of red wine spilled on a brand new white couch. It's a stain. And people outside and apart from Christ do everything they can to cover them, to cover their conscience, to do things that will try to cover over their sins, to appease conscience, to make them feel like they can cover up the bad. But that doesn't work. It's like an experience I've often had, perhaps more than many of you, of lying down to take a nap on my couch with a fleece blanket. It's after lunch on Saturday. I'm ready for a nap. I lay down on the couch. I pull the blanket up to my chin, only to find that my shins down to my feet are completely exposed. And so I get my feet and wrestle the blanket back down to the bottom of my toes, only to find that from about my mid-torso on up, I'm exposed again. And no matter which direction I pull the blanket, something's left uncovered. And that's like what the person outside of Christ, the unbeliever does when they try to cover their sins. Every time they pull the work one way, another sin is exposed and they pull it to cover that one and another is exposed in another place. But Jesus gives rest for the soul because by his blood he covers all your sins and cleanses you from all unrighteousness clothing you as the picture in Revelation describes in garments of white. Rest for your body, rest for your mind, rest for your soul, and then fourth and finally, rest for eternity. For the author of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, that as much as we can embrace the physical rest, the mental rest, the soul rest that Jesus provides here, we know that there's more rest to come. We know that this life will ever be full of trial and travail and sin. But Jesus offers rest for your body, mind, and soul, not only in this life in the present, but for eternity. We see that pictured in Revelation 7, verses 16 to 17. When John says, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear 
from their eyes. There is a fine rest, a full rest, a consummate rest that lasts forever. We taste it incompletely, though joyfully now. But the scripture promises that all who have Christ as their shepherd will forever in the resurrection rest from sin and sorrow and pain and death. And you notice there in Revelation 7 that they'll enjoy that rest. We will enjoy that rest. Not only on account of the shepherd, but with the shepherd. That the ultimate, perfect rest that Jesus provides, the final green pastures and still waters, is rest with him. The shepherd with the sheep, and the sheep with the shepherd for ages upon ages upon ages. These are the ways that Jesus provides rest for your body, for your mind, for your soul, and for eternity. And I want to point out as we close here that this rest is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Remember the pronouns. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. If you find him, the shepherd, then you will find rest here by faith and fully in eternity. Robert Murray McShane gives us a good rule as we think about the Christian life. He says it is good to consider your ways, but it is far better to consider Christ. And Psalm 23, verse 2, helps us to do just that. To look to the shepherd who gives rest, who makes us lie down in green pastures, and leads us beside still waters. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we praise you for your provision, for your care, for your grace to the sheep in the Good Shepherd. We thank you for the physical rest. We thank you that we can lay the anxieties of the mind at his feet. And we thank you, Father, that you have made provision for forgiveness and righteousness and cleansing for us in him. I pray, Father, that you would fill all of your sheep with rest as they look to the shepherd. And I pray, Father, for any who don't have them, that they would be restless until they find the rest that is found in him and him alone. Would you bring them to him, O Lord, knowing that once they're in him, none shall pluck them out. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We'll respond to God's word, joining our voices, singing hymn number 188, Jesus, I am resting, resting. Let's join in standing as you're able and sing.
may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all.